steaks and chops. Our char grilled here, behind the garish neon glow, lunch and dinner, Italian cuisine, a glow slightly softened by white lace curtains. At Sam's place, a court street barnacle since the 1930s, the five families' salad days. By habitués, I'm told, of dubious and not salubrious kinds, meaning Brooklyn-bred mobsters with a bulge in their chests, unrelated to excessive ravioli eating. Large, dark-browed men, nothing lacy about them, who hold court, always facing the front door, while Sam, cigarette affixed perpetually to his lower lip, still make sure their steaks and chops are black and blue, never, God forbid, near overcooked. Welcome to the latest Floating Poetry broadcast, and thank you for leaning in to show 198, coming to you live from New England, from the throwback coast of Rhode Island. This is your poet, illuminator, and guiding spirit in the poetosphere, Colin Gerdeke, a voice here and elsewhere for living our days more fully, more alively, more poetically. If you uh, didn't lean in to last week's broadcast, number 197, it was From the Heart, also paired with Valentine's Day, as both dates serendipitously entwined, where we visited the, the ways we come or can come beautifully to poignantly, openly to deeply from our hearts and others from theirs, places and moments hearts first met, heartfelt places, the inviting, the enlivening, the, the enchanting, loving experiences, sparking outpourings, heart pourings, musings on romance, fidelity, and the heart and flower filled holiday itself. Several couples even listened in live over supper as part of their Valentine's Day date nights. Well, this week, diners, luncheonettes, and soda fountains. Very particular features of the small town culinary landscape, especially, and the, uh, the larger American food culture. Wonderful oases for many back in time. Still vivid memories for many today and maybe many of you listening. And while the great and true originals have largely vanished, their salad days, their, their golden era, more past, I would say, for me, at least how I've seen it, I felt them worth appreciating here, even for those of you who didn't grow up with them. And to view them tastily, from cake slices of history to spritzes of films, songs, and, and words from listeners about their experiences. Some good ones this week. Well, no knock at all on the diners still to be found out there. Glad they're out there and, and being enjoyed, even the retro ones. But more a look for this show at the, uh, the most and more vintage kind, the classics and their heydays. So I have dished up a full-on show of cultural commentary, poetry, quotes, anecdotes, and discovery for us around this theme. These icons and, uh, yes, our booth, our seat at the counter is waiting. Let's go. And you can have whatever you want. It's my treat tonight. I thought we'd start with um, something from singer Tom Waits. From 1975, his album Nighthawks at the Diner, obviously a nod to the Edward Hopper painting of the diner, Nighthawks. And um, these are the lyrics to the song, uh, Eggs and Sausage. Verse 1. Nighthawks at the diner of Emma's 49er. There's a rendezvous of strangers around the coffee urn tonight. All the gypsy hacks and the insomniacs. Now the paper's been read. Now the waitress said... Eggs and sausage and a side of toast, coffee and a roll, hash browns over easy, chili in a bowl with burgers and fries. What kind of pie? Yeah. It's a graveyard charade. It's a late shift masquerade, and it's two for a quarter, dime for a dance, Woolworth's rhinestone diamond earrings and a sideways glance. Now the register rings. 
Now the waitress sings, eggs and sausage and a side of toast, coffee and a roll, hash browns over easy, chili in a bowl with burgers and fries. What kind of pie? Yeah. Now, well, the classified section offers no direction. It's a cold caffeine and a nicotine cloud. Now the touch of your fingers lingers, burning in my memory. I've been 86 from your scheme. Now I'm a melodramatic nocturnal scene. Now I'm a refugee from a disconcerted affair. Now the lead pipe morning falls. Now the waitress calls. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Waits. I'll go back and listen to that again. <laughs> He's got quite a gravelly voice, doesn't he? That Tom Waits. Well, um, Bernadette Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. A homage to H and the Speedway Diner. It's a lot like a cave full of pictures and black and white check flags. You may overdose on caffeine. It's the closest restaurant to our house, maybe five miles. It's very cheap. You can go there when you have almost no money. They let you use the telephone. I can get steak tartare there for $2.25, but I've never called it that, just raw hamburger with an egg yolk. Pickle relish and garlic powder plus the Celtic salt I bring along. The owner, H, after whom the H burger is named, is loquacious, surprising, has a Santa Claus belly and wears suspenders. There's ashtrays everywhere and a great old pinball machine. It's like East Nassau, but it's in West Lebanon, I think. You can always talk about the weather and hunting. The clientele is open-minded, as are the waitress and waiter who kneels when he takes your order. During hunting season, it opens at 4.30 a.m. It's for sale, but that's not quite serious. H's wife thinks he spends too much time there, which he does. So she started calling him by their dog's name, Peaches. H is a big fan of Northern Exposure. Oh, and I forgot to mention the biscuits and sausage gravy, which are genuine, grayish, and great. Recently, H got a smoker, and this year will go to the New Year's Eve party and eat stuffed shrimp and or lobster. Homage to H in the Speedway Diner. Thank you, Bernadette Mayer. This is from her collection, Scarlet Tanager. I like that title. From the poetryfoundation.org, poets, David Lynch wants you to write poems about diners. Diners feature heavily in the work of David Lynch, so naturally it would come up in an interview for Food and Wine. And here's what he has to say about them. A poet could write volumes about diners because they're so beautiful. They're brightly lit with chrome and booths and naga hide and great waitresses. Now, it might not be so great in the health department, but I think dinner, diner food is really worth experiencing periodically. I love super crispy, almost burned, snapping crispy bacon. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, and here's one more of his, uh, this cinematic uh, diner lover, diner file. He also said... Um, there's a safety in thinking in a diner. You can have your coffee or your milkshake, and you can go off into strange, dark areas and always come back to the safety of the diner. But that, interesting. Uh, Dana Joya, G-I-O-I-A, from her collection, 99 Poems, Men After Work. Done with work, they are sitting by themselves in coffee shops or diners taking up the booths, filling every other seat along the counter, waiting for the menu, for the water, for the girl to come and take their order, always on the edge of words, almost without appetite, knowing there is nothing on the menu that they want, waiting patiently to ask for one more refill of their coffee, surprised that even its bitterness will not wake them up. Still they savor it, holding each sip lukewarm in their mouths, this last taste of evening. Thank you, Dana Joya, for that. Well, I thought I'd pair Philip Levine's poem, uh, dialing back to uh, circa 1940s, 50s. The two. When he gets off work at Packard, they meet outside a diner on Grand Boulevard. He's tired, a bit depressed, and smelling the exhaustion of, on his own breath. He kisses her carefully on her left cheek. Early April, and the weather has not decided if this is spring, winter, or what. The two gaze upwards at the sky, which gives nothing away. The low clouds break here and there and let in tiny slices of a pure blue heaven. 
The day is like us, she thinks. It hasn't decided what to become. The traffic light at Linwood goes from red to green, and the trucks start up, uh, so that when he says, Would you like to eat? She hears a jumble of words that mean nothing, though spiced with things she cannot believe. Wooden Jew and lucky meat. He's been up late, she thinks. He's tired of the job, perhaps tired of their morning meetings, but when he bows from the waist and holds the door open for her to enter the diner, and the thick odor of bacon frying and new potatoes greets them both, and taking heart she enters to peer through the thick cloud of tobacco smoke to see if, quote, their booth is available. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote that there were no second acts in America, but he knew neither this man nor this woman, and no one else like them, unless he stayed late at the office to test his famous one-liner, quote, We keep you clean, muscatine, on the woman emptying his wastebasket. Fitzgerald never wrote with someone present, except for this woman in a gray uniform, whose comings and goings went unnoticed, even on those December evenings she worked late, while the snow fell silently on the window sills and the new fluorescent lights blinked on and off. Get back to the two, you say. Not who ordered poached eggs, who ordered only toast and coffee, who shared the bacon with the other, but what became of the two when this poem ended, whose arms held whom, who first said, I love you, and truly meant it, and who misunderstood the words, so longed for, and yet still so unexpected, and began suddenly to scream and curse until the waitress asked them both to leave. The Packard plant closed years before I left Detroit. The diner was burned to the ground in 67, two years before my oldest son fled to Sweden to escape the American dream. And the lovers, you ask? I wrote nothing about lovers. Take a look. Clouds, trucks, traffic lights, a diner, work, a wooden shoe, East Moline, poached eggs, the perfume of frying bacon, the chaos of language, the spices of spent breath after eight hours of night work. Can you hear all I feared and never dared to write? Why the two are more real than either you or me? Why I never returned to keep them in my life? How little I now mean to myself or anyone else what any of this could mean, where you found the patience to endure these truths and confessions? Thank you, Philip Levine. Very interesting. The two, I had not read that of his other things, but not that. Well, from the BBC... Dot com. Why is the din uh, diner? Why the diner is the ultimate symbol of America? It's from 2011, this piece, with its chrome counter and cherry pie, the diner is an icon of American culture. What's the global appeal of this humble eatery? Asks the BBC's Stephen Smith. So here are a few pieces from his piece. Um, the thing about this democratic counter is that anyone can go in and sit down. It can be a professor. It can be a worker. Says Richard. Gutman, author of American Diner Then and Now. Uh, singer Suzanne Vega, uh, there's a picture of her in Tom's restaurant. A friend of mine in Pennsylvania ate in a diner, and he's in the middle of two guys. One is the chief of police, and the other is just some character. The policeman looks over and says, didn't I arrest you last year? And the guy says, yes, you did. Uh, pass the ketchup. <laughs> well, Gutman, that fellow we just quoted, uh, has reclaimed 80 abandoned luncheonettes, and his memorabilia now occupies 4,000 square feet of a catering college near his home in Rhode Island. My home. Look him up. I was first interested in diners because of their architecture and their vernacular nature, he says. They were built by Italian tile setters and marble workers by German sheet metal workers and French-Canadian carpenters. It was a melting pot of these different cultures to produce a building that is uniquely American. His favorite working cafeteria, the Modern Diner in Rhode Island, is the first such establishment to be preserved for posterity on the National Register of Historic Places. I have a note to go there, friends, actually telling you that um, to myself. Its graceful lines had been cribbed from the railroad dining car. In fact, the all-American origins of the diner go back even further than that, to the chuck wagon, which fed cowboys on the range. How about that? In the movies, the diner is a special kind of space, a mythic place, a zone of escape, says film critic John Patterson. Paradoxically, the diner is about loneliness and isolation, as well as down-home hospitality. Its enigmatic charm has helped it to resist fierce competition from fast food chains, but fans of the Wayside Canteen can't be complacent. They would do well to reflect on the poignant question that you hear asked over the counter of every diner. 
Do you want that to go? <laughs> That's good. It's a good ending. Thank you, BBC, for that. Well, why don't we dive into some questions right now? Questions for you about diners, luncheonettes, and soda fountains. Starting with, what wonderful or otherwise memorable past experiences did you ever have at a diner or a luncheonette or soda fountain? Maybe even all three. There's actually someone I'm going to tell you about that had stories from all three. And I'm thinking both as a child and then later as an adult. And where were you? The spot or spots in the vignette. What was the name of your most favorite spot? Where was it? What did it look like? Who were the regulars? Who were the waitresses or servers or the, quote, soda jerks? Do you remember their names, their faces? I remember one as a boy uh, growing up in Short Hills, New Jersey, at our local pharmacy who worked the soda fountain. I cannot remember his name right now, but I remember his face very well and his shape. He looked like the comic actor Lou Costello from Abbott and Costello. He wore a white paper hat, and when I'd come walking in, he'd say, Hello, Collie Baby! <laughs> and, and he'd start making my usual, without me asking for it, a chocolate milkshake with vanilla ice cream at the time in one of those mixers on the counter, right? That, uh, in the tall steel cup that got all frosty with the cold shake frothing up, uh, frothing up in front of me as I sat in the green swivel stool with the chrome rim. Well... What about what you love to have to eat or drink at your favorite place? Maybe bacon and eggs over easy, a club sandwich, a milkshake. Well, there was one um, hamburger spot, hamburger joint. My dad would take us uh, all to his kids. It was pretty spiffy, actually, um, a short drive from our house, and it was called Bonds, B-O-N-D-S. Great hamburgers, char-grilled, served on a toasted bun, and uh, crazy thick milkshakes called Awful Awfuls, which were awfully wonderful. And to a little fellow like me at the time, they, they appeared immense, like you know, giant in their glasses. And the best part for me, actually, was on the paper plate, they always served a small paper cup of sherbet, a palate cleanser. I never forgot that surprising and uh, fanciful touch. I always look forward to that as much as the hamburger. And uh, in uh, prep school, I worked on the school newspaper, The Pirate, and we'd often have deadlines and finish late into uh, of an evening. And, and before heading home, we'd all pile into somebody's car and drive to a late-night diner, always the same place a few towns away, called The Claremont, right out of a Woody Allen movie. If you, if, you, if you went to there when we were going, you would say we're in a Woody Allen movie. Classic shining wraparound steel full of colorful characters and conversations. I have many, many memories of uh, the four or five of us there. Um, you know, this, the, the, my, my senior editor, I'm the junior editor, and a couple of the others on the staff. Well, the place was always hopping. And it was so fun. The funny thing to me there. It was a maitre d' <laughs> in a diner. <laughs> His name was Mel. He was the owner, Mel. And a hostess who was always dolled up in a 1970s pantsuit, lots of jewelry. <laughs> e even though we were all standing in a waiting area the size of a small parking space, he'd be in right in front of you on a microphone and a loud PA system. <laughs> and you'd come up for, you know, for a table and he'd say, how, how many are we? <laughs> You'd say like, you know, four or five, and he'd say, the, the lovely Charmaine will see you to your seat, Charmaine. <laughs> I mean, it was worth it just, just for Mel and Charmaine. Uh, they should have cast them somewhere. Maybe they did. Well, everybody ordered their regular dishes. Michael, I remember, a pastrami sandwich, which he would dissect, dissect like, like a surgeon uh, and, uh, or a biologist. And, and me, a slice of banana cream pie. Yeah, loved that, that and coconut cream pie. But banana cream, they made a wicked good one. I also remember mounds of dubious coleslaw. I never ate that. Yeah, it was very suspect. Well, if your favorite hangout was a diner, and back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, what songs did you play or recall hearing on the jukebox? And when you went, did you like to sit at the counter 
or in a booth. I'd, uh, I'd love to uh, share now some of what fellow listeners and others sent me on our theme. Uh, okay, first is from Dick in Fort Worth, Texas, who grew up in New York City. He's in his 80s now. So that goes to, we're dialing back quite a while when he was a boy. He said, we had three drugstores in our neighborhood while growing up in the Washington Heights section of Manhattan. Two had soda fountains. A big treat was to have a cherry Coke. On the weekends, in good weather, the, quote, big boys played softball. Us, quote, little boys would make nickel and dime tips by fetching them sodas, riding our bikes a few blocks to the, quote, candy store. Good one. Thank you, Dick. Um, from Susan in Cape May. And happy birthday to her. I believe it's her birthday today. I just heard. Sang her a little song the other day when I heard that. Um, well, she hit the trifecta with a story about a diner and a lunch net in a soda fountain. How about that? I'm impressed by that. Um, okay, diners. The waitresses back in the day were downtrodden and hardcore. They would stand over your table, pad in hand, pencil stuck behind their ear, cigarette hanging off their lips, and, and then would say, what can I get for you, hun? <laughs> Everybody was named hun. <laughs> the short order cook was never named cookie. <laughs> People watching usually took place after 2 a.m. in the diner since they were open 24 hours a day. The late night stragglers coming in from the clubs and the beautiful people. If you ordered eggs after 2 a.m., you would always put ketchup on your eggs. To ask her about that. <laughs> Why? Um, the waitress would return with six trays on one arm like a juggler in the circus. She would be able to put each plate in front of the right person. It was a beautiful thing. The jukeboxes in the booth back in the 70s always had the same staple of songs. Donna Summer, disco music, Frank Sinatra, New York, New York, but... Never family fair. Now, luncheonettes. They were very popular in the late 60s and early to mid-70s. This particular one was situated in Elizabeth, New Jersey on Broad Street. The week before, I was in Manhattan going to a nightclub called Danceteria. At 3 a.m., I ended up at the Brasserie and got an Eggs Benedict. A week later, I was shopping with my mother, and after some shopping, my mother, aunt, and myself are at the luncheonette. I ordered an Eggs Benedict. The waitress said, I'm sorry, honey, we don't have hollandaise sauce here. My mother and aunt started laughing. Then I got offended because I didn't realize that hollandaise sauce was more of an upscale type sauce that they don't normally make in a luncheonette. So I settled for a BLT. <laughs> uh, N, okay, it's <laughs> soda fountains. When my mom was 16, she worked at a corner soda fountain after school. She was a soda jerk. My father, a big strapping man, would go to the soda fountain after school to see my mom. He finally, I wonder if she would be a jerkette, <laughs> female soda jerk. Uh, so he'd go to the soda fountain after school to see my mom. He finally got the nerve to ask her out. The problem was they had conflicting schedules. They could only see each other once a week for maybe two hours. Fast forward. With advanced careers having gone through different hardships over the years and many memories behind them, they managed to stay married for 54 years until they both passed on. Thank you, Susan, for all those good stories. And then her husband, Paul, he weighed in. He said, now for my story, it's all about the food. Sometimes I take for granted of how many diners are here in the state of New Jersey. There are over 500, and they are as common as a corner gas station. I did not know that. I'm just, I heard another story you'll hear in a minute. I, I, I just didn't realize that there's, there's still quite a few. Maybe been taken over and changed around and not quite the old style, but that's okay. It's a good, good thing to hear. But as a rule of thumb, he said, what is the best diner to go to? I was told go to where all the truckers eat. So that's what I do as I drive along the highway and see a diner with a lot of trucks. I know they have good food. Back in the 1970s, before cell phones, the only form of communication between the truckers was using a CB radio. They would give their location and say where the best diner was as they're en route toward their destination. Drive-ins are another establishment that fascinate me. My father and mother would take my three brothers and two sisters to a hot dog stand. They had car hop service. My father would be able to order three hot dogs for six kids and a basket of french fries, and we would all be happy. We called it a picnic in the car. Good one. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, here's one from, um, from Robin from here in Westerly, who I spoke with uh, last night about uh, the program. And she said she wanted to share a bit about her 
diner experiences. I knew she had some good ones, so hold on. Uh, during college, uh, I didn't have any money. I had to, I was work, I was cleaning houses and, and uh, had work study. It was a big, like 30 bucks a week or something, you know, between classes and, and rowing. And so after practices, because we were so poor, the big treat would be go to one of the diners because for like two bucks and change, you would get like two pancakes, two eggs, bacon, sausage. And so we used to sit there, and I can remember feeling, oh, man, oh, this is royalty. This is so good. I can actually afford this. <laughs> <laughs> and we all, we all cram into the booths, you know, like three and Sure. Do you feel? Do you feel a, a lot of people in at that time, different towns across America felt the same way, and maybe even before uh, that? Yeah, I think you know it was it was for the blue collar, you know, to bring the family to breakfast. That was a big deal, but also you see the lovers and the date. And the, and the old, the elders, you know, and then you see the groups of men, you know, John about politics, or you know, the, the kids, yes, kids, you know, or whatever. So I have fond memories of, of the diner. You know, and what was the name of the one? What was the name of your diner that that you loved? What was the name of that? One? Well, we used to go to Miss Worcester. Mi Miss Worcester, the Miss Worcester Diner. Yeah. Worcester, yeah, Mass. I was yeah. Looking or the Boulevard Diner. The Boulevard in in Worcester. In Worcester, there's eleven of them. In Worcester. Now, eleven diners now. Yes. Yeah. Now they're, to go. Oh, I. They're, they're, are they making a comeback? <laughs> no, they've always been there. Uh, wow. Oh, and then there's Rosie's two blocks from my brother. Did and they all have their um, you know, their regulars, different regulars? You wouldn't see the same people at. This, those diners necessarily, you wouldn't. You see the regulars in the booths. In the booths. Yeah, yeah they go. They have a coffee. They can sit there for a couple of hours. And then we have all the the fish gatiers, right? That that we know they here. They go to Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, they don't. No, Doug invited me to go with them. I said, "Where are you going?" And Dunkin' Donuts. I said, "Oh, no, Doug, I can't do that. I I hate their coffee." I thought they went to the the. Um, the uh, little cafe, what Amanda's, or yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe. Yeah, Amanda's probably 113 years old now. Who is Amanda? <laughs> Still serving. She just, she just sits at the door with her doily. Yeah. Yeah, the Miss Worcester. Oh well, thank you for sharing that. Oh my God, it was so much fun, so much fun. But it was, it was the, it was the, uh, the status. It was, wasn't so much about the food. It was like, wow, I can go out and have breakfast. That's you lovely. Know? That's yeah, lovely. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for that reminiscence, Robin. Thank you. Um, here's another local one. This is from Hannah. Um, when I was four or five years old, my mother used to take me to a diner with an old-fashioned lunch counter while my sister was at her weekly ballet class. We would sit at the counter on the stools, and my mother would order me a buttered corn muffin and orangeade, both novel foods for me. This seemingly ordinary event made an impression on me. I still remember it well, sitting at the counter on the spinning stools and eating something different than what we ate at home was part of what was special. But the other significant part is this memory of a calm, peaceful time alone with my mother, just the two of us sitting at the counter. Lovely. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, I actually got a poem from a listener, a regular listener. That's a first. Uh, this is um, uh, Jimmy Roberts in New York City, the Broadway diner. He is a not only a wonderful friend and a fellow poet, but a wildly gifted pianist and lyricist and composer. Um, okay, the Broadway diner. 
The years have marked their faces, these Greek men, cashier, cook, waiter. Yet they endure along with scratch formica countertops, vinyl booths patched with duct tape. On the walls, made dark by time, black and white posters, Elvis, Marilyn, Marlin. Someone's long ago idea of what a diner, a New York diner, should look like. The regulars come for the grits, pastrami, and eggs, toast slathered with butter. There's the old lady nursing her Lipton tea, the pet shop owner on lunch break, ex-yuppies tired of upscale coffee bars, and me. I sip hot tomato soup from a heavy chip bowl, read the times, folded three ways at the cramped counter. I spoke, I joke with Jimmy, the waiter, about our identical names. He eyes my nearly empty bowl. It was good, yes? He's been on his side of the counter, and I and mine for four decades. But as the city struggles, so does this place. For the pandemic, they set up flimsy metal tables and chairs on the sidewalk. Across the street, empty stores for rent or abandoned. Will the Broadway diner be next? The sign outside in faded red script beams the holy trinity of every city diner. Steaks, chops, seafood. And an aging but loyal clientele still comes for the men and the menu that never change. Wonderful. Thank you, Jimmy. Wonderful. The Broadway Diner. Lovely gift for me and all of us. Well, just a few last questions for each of us before we carry on. Um, If you had a luncheonette, soda fountain, or diner of your own, what would you name it? And why? What's the very best part of going to or being at a diner for you? And do you ever wax nostalgic for the old-style ones, bygone times? Maybe times you never experienced but would have liked to. All right, on we go. And coffee refills available to anybody if you want them. Virtual coffee. Mark Vince, V-I-N-Z, Vince, Center Cafe. Well, you're in town then. The boys from the class reunion wander in and take their places in the corner booth, just as they might have 50 years ago. Grayer, balder, wearing hats, announcing places far away. Their conversation rises, falls to the inevitable. A missing friend who worked right up until the end. Another who is long past traveling. Smiles grow distant as their silence overtakes the room. The busy waitress pauses, nods. She's always known the boys. Thank you, Mark Benz. Center Cafe. Very nice. From mentalfloss.com. Uh, if you live in the U.S., you probably have a diner that's special to you, whether it's a 24-hour spot that you drank coffee and ate French fries in as a teen or a mom-and-pop shop where your family went for Sunday breakfast and where you probably always ordered the exact same thing. Diners began as mobile food wagons that would come out at night to serve simple meals to workers on the third shift. They were literal wagons, carts pulled by horses. These uh, lunch wagons started turning into lunch, quote, cars. Then in the 20s, they became known as dining cars, which was eventually shortened to diners. The seating was often a simple counter with stools designed so that customers didn't stay too long. I did not know that. That's a well, interesting reason. Uh, throughout the 20th century, New Jersey was the leading maker of diners. About 95% of all prefab diners were built in the state. They were shipped worldwide. To this day, New Jersey is known as the diner capital of the world. Well, while lunch wagons started in the cities, they write here, diners thrived in the suburbs. The diners of the 50s were made from silvery, sleek, modern metal railroad cars. Some were built as freestanding buildings, but they still had shiny stainless steel exteriors, neon signs, and a space-age appearance. But if we're getting technical, they, they'd be properly called coffee shops. The term diner technically referred to factory-built prefab restaurants from dining cars that were shipped to a location. And then they talk about the iconic Greek diner. We just heard Jimmy's poem. Um, the American Northeast still is the highest concentration of traditional diners in the country. 2,000 alone spread out over New England. But in the 1960s, the increasing spread of chain restaurants led to a diner decline. And they talk about the Greek restaurants and uh, the crazy menus, 200 items. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, diners today with the rising cost of real estate in the tri-state area, some diners are being priced out of existence. Many have been torn down for luxury high rises, others displaced by drugstore chains or banks. Surviving ones face competition, stiff competition. Um, they mentioned the oldest continually operated one in New York is the Nom Wa Tea Parlor, a dim sum shop on Doyer Street that opened in 1920. When you think of diners, you might, might, mine might not go straight to dumplings and chicken feet, but this New York institution suggests the expansive culinary traditions that can fit under the ever-evolving, quote, diner label. So at the end, it says it's hard to say if the diner will survive the next transition. So if you're lucky enough to have a family-run diner in your city or town, make sure to kick them some business. And don't forget about the pies. Come on. I have so much wonderful material. We may not get to it all. We'll give it. I'm, I'm going to see if we can. Might run a little bit over. Uh, we'll see. I don't think we can break it into two parts. I think that would, it's all going to be one thing or not. One or bust. Um, there was a whole um, piece on uh, called counterculture. Very interesting. I, I don't think I'll have time to read this one, but it's from the from BoweryBoysHistory.com. History of automats, luncheonettes, and diners in New York City in particular. And they mentioned the automat, which I actually will get to that um, in, a, in a form, in a way. Uh, well, you know, we're talking about memories people have and of these familiar yet particularly um, one of a kind to those people places. And this is uh, Angela Narciso Torres, the immigrant visits her mother. Those tropical mornings, I woke to no sun in a shuttered room, the shuffle of slippers at my door, hall light flooding the gap, her slight frame could not fill, smaller than when I last saw her. Through the net of sleep floated her voice, repeating my name. I rose, stumbled to my feet, offered my arm. Her good leg leading, we made our way to the dim-lit table, where I sliced a bagel neatly in half, fed it to the glowing toaster. When the rounds popped out, fragrant, golden, I spread the cream thin with a knife, layered the slivers of smoked salmon from the packet I'd carried from Chicago, a twist of lemon to finish. One bite, and her eyes glazed over, forehead uncreased. For a moment she was twenty-six, a medical student again, lipstick and bone-tired from her shift, sitting in a Brooklyn diner to coffee, a bagel, and the Times. Here, decades and hemispheres away, dawn burns through manila smog, licks the blinds of the kitchen where my mother fills her mouth with the salt and sting of her first New York winter the year before I was born. Lovely. Thank you, Angela Narciso Torres, from her collection, What Happens is Neither. New, new to me, her and the poem. Lunch counters, a Wikipedia, says, um, were once commonly located inside the variety stores, also known as Five and Dimes, Five and Tens, or dime stores, pharmacies, and department stores in the U.S. throughout the 20th century. The intent of the, that was to profit from serving hungry shoppers and to attract people to the store so they might buy merchandise. Woolworths, the earliest, uh, or one of the earliest Five and Dimes, opened their first luncheonette in New Albany, Indiana, around 1923. Typical foods found there were hot and cold sandwiches, Ham and cheese, grilled cheese, BLT, patty melts, egg salad, soups, pie, ice cream, including sundaes, ice cream, sodas, milkshakes, soda, coffee, and hot chocolate. Lunch counters. Well, here's, here's a luncheonette poem from uh, uh, Lucia Perillo, a romance. I saw a child set down her binder like a wall through the candy bin at the corner luncheonette so she could scoop out gum while she spoke to the clerk. And from that moment was in love. Oh, theft. College was supposed to straighten me like a bent tree strangled by a wire, but being done with sweetness, I could not resist the lure of meat. How the red muscle gleamed in its shiny wrap, a wedge that had once been the thigh or the loin of a slow brute's body, sugar dirt and clotted grass to be snatched in an instant and zipped into the croniest of pocketbooks. Radiance housed in rawhide again, as when it was living. A steak can be stuck in your jeans when you're skinny, a rump roast is right for a puffy down coat. Small chops will fit under a thin peasant blouse where it falls off the breast like a woodland reeve with a limestone amphitheater underneath. <laughs> I didn't read this all completely because I wanted to be surprised, and I am. Uh, ancient city, ancient sublet, ancient wooden fire escape. With my other bandits, I learned how to, to say howdy-do in French. 
We were yanking on the cord that would start the motor of our lives, though we did not have the choke adjusted yet. <laughs> Sometimes it seems I floated in the dregs like a tea bag, floating up with the facts. Until a girl ran in the door, panting hard, face red, slab thudding from her snowflake damask waist onto the table, as we stood around it gawking at the way it seemed to breathe. <laughs> well, wait do you hear the title of her collection. Uh, her collection, in, From Inseminating the Elephant. <laughs> we might have gathered she'd write something like that title. Wild. How about this one? This is, this is more fanciful and romantic, this next one. This is about a luncheonette. Gregory Orr, O-R-R, love poem. A black biplane crashes through the window of the luncheonette. The pilot climbs down, removing his leather hood. He hands me my grandmother's jade ring. No, it is two robin's eggs and a telephone number. Yours. Gregory Orr, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, soda fountains. Let's talk about those. Um, uh, Wikipedia tells us a small eating establishment, soda shop, or luncheonette common from the late 19th century until the mid-20th, often inside a drugstore, candy store, or other business, where a soda jerk served carbonated beverages, ice cream, and sometimes light meals. The soda jerk's fountain generally dispensed only unflavored carbonated water, to which various syrups were added by hand only. Well, it's interesting that Initially, they were an attempt to replicate mineral waters that bubbled up from the earth, especially over in Europe. That was sort of the uh, impetus. Well, in their heyday, they flourished in pharmacies, ice cream parlors, dime stores, milk bars, train stations, and they served an important function as a public space where neighbors could socialize and exchange community news. In the early 20th century, many expanded their menus and became lunch counters, serving light meals as well. They reached their height in the 1940s and 50s. In 1950, Walgreens, one of the largest chains of American drugstores, introduced a full self-service drugstore that began the decline of the soda fountain. And on it goes, tear in the eye. I should have had like, well, I'm not drinking dairy. At the, uh, I'm not doing that, but I, I, could have, I could have made maybe a coconut milk milkshake. Mm. I should have thought of that. Well, another time. How about this from uh, the Writer's Almanac, a uh, bit of early soda history. Um, the first glass of Coca-Cola, which originally contained cocaine, was sold for five cents at a soda fountain in Jacob's Pharmacy in Atlanta, Georgia on, in, nine, in 18, rather, 1886. Um, they said the exact recipe is still a trade secret, but it no longer c contains cocaine, just caffeine. But... I had to include, <laughs> this was too much fun. Uh, it, it's um, from uh, Atlas Obscura, the lost lingo of New York City's soda jerks. I just thought that was great. Um, so um, there's a whole story about, the, it starts out in the 40s and students at Columbia University, but I'm just going to go right to the, 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 the things they called the different drinks. And all black was a chocolate soda with chocolate ice cream. A baby was a glass of fresh milk. A black cow was a root beer. A CO cocktail was castor oil prepared in soda. Why would they drink that? Choker holes were donuts. A cowcumber was a pickle. Draw some mud was coffee. A glob was a plain sundae. A high yellow black and white was a chocolate soda with vanilla ice cream. In the hay was a strawberry milkshake. A 95, customer walking out without paying. Mug of, a mug of murk, cup of coffee without cream. An OG, G-E-E, -E, was orangeade. One on the house, water, a pop boy, soda man who doesn't know his business. A salt water man, an ice cream mixer. Scandal soup was tea. <laughs> I'll have some scandal soup. Uh, and, and yum yum was sugar. Isn't that fun? Yeah, I like that. Maybe you're, maybe you're giggling. I hope so. Uh, well, a soda fountain poem by Mark Doty, D-O-T-Y. Brian, age seven. Grateful for their tour of the pharmacy, the first grade class had, has drawn these pictures, each self-portrait taped to the window glass, faces wide to the street, round and available, with parallel lines for hair. I like this one best. 
Brian, whose attenuated name fills a quarter of the frame, stretched beside impossible legs descending from the ball of his torso, two long arms springing from that same central sphere. He breathes here on his page. It isn't craft that makes this figure come alive. Brian draws just balls and lines in wobbly crayon strokes. Why do some marks seem to thrill with life, possess a portion of the nervous energy in their maker's hand? That big curve of a smile reaches nearly to the rim of his face. He holds a towering ice cream, brown spheres teetering on their cone, a soda fountain gift half the length of him, as if it were the flag of his own country held high by the unadorned black line of his arm such naked support for so much delight. Artless boy, he's found a system of beauty. He shows us pleasure and what pleasure resists. The ice cream is delicious. He's frail beside his relentless standard. Brian H. Seven, thank you, Mark Doty. And uh, the Automat, that, they, were, they were great. Um, I, I have good boyhood memories of that, of the Automat in New York City. Um, well, here's Nicholas Christopher's poem, The Automat. On 42nd Street and 3rd Avenue, where my grandfather, in his brown suit and fedora, his vest with the silver pocket watch, used to take me for lunch. Salisbury steak, scalloped potatoes, snap peas, and deep dish apple pie. After which he would clip and smoke an Upman Corona, Cuban cigars not yet banned in the USA, and explain the difference between hand-rolled and machine-rolled cigars, the fine points in which he was well-versed the wrapper cut into a delicate spiral by the curved blade of the chavita, and the cap triple-layered to hold its shape through a long smoke. Having been a cigar roller himself as a 14-year-old refugee, making his way from Macedonia to America by way of Istanbul and Caracas, where he rolled in humid rooms at long tables with men two and three times his age, giant fans whirring in the corners, and a hired storyteller in a rocking chair entertaining the rollers with his repertoire of fables and romances, Love stories for men who rolled 12 hours a day, 10 cents an hour, until their fingers went numb, and then slept in rooming houses, four to a room. His name was Nicholas, too, my grandfather. He lived on bean soup and bread, saving to buy passage to New York, learning to watch out for certain men and to resist the brothels, having seen sailors ravaged by syphilis, and to avoid the police who would shake down a boy with no work papers, just a passport from the Ottoman Empire that was still occupying the village he had escaped actually which he had been ordered to leave by his father, my great-grandfather, a farmer on three barren acres, who at the height of a famine said that there were five of them in the family, himself, his wife, three children, and only enough food for four, and no way around it, except for my grandfather, the eldest son, to leave. And sixty years later find himself, after a lifetime of manual work, American sons who fought in wars, an American daughter who died young, in an automat with his grandson, who could deposit nickels and steel slots and from glass compartments, misted by heat and wafting aromas, extract a meal. It's a wonderful piece. Thank you, Nicholas Christopher. I loved my own experience, too, as a kid, and the chicken pot pie and the rice pudding. It was all delicious, very well made. And uh, seeing the, uh, the cooks and other people behind the scenes through the little glass doors um, of good food, the automat. Well, I was going to tell you about some of the... A Thrillist has a list of some of the best diners in America, um, ones that are seemingly, they say, divorced from time, where you're likely to be referred to as Hun, as a cross-section of the city's population buzzes around at all hours. Well, I'll just give you quickly the names. I'm, there's little, little squibs about them, but Frank's Diner in Kenosha, Wisconsin, from 1926, still going. Uh, the Otis Cafe, um, hidden down a winding forest road from from the Oregon coast in Lincoln City. Uh, the Palace Diner in Biddeford, Maine, founded in 1927. Uh, the facade uh, in yellow letters of the words, Ladies Invited, with that 15-stool diner. Strawn's East Eat, Sh Eat Shop in Shreveport, Louisiana. It says, Diner dreams are made of crisp, griddled hash browns and American cheese-covered, thin pattied burgers, dripping American cheese. But the crown jewel of these is, is diner pie. And Strawn's has some of the best in the entire South. But that. There's also a piece from uh, clickamericana.com on vintage 40s diners. But I'm going to pass on that. Yeah. We don't have time for all of that. 
although it's interesting. I would like to just carry on with some other things. Last sort of last set of things here, relatively. Uh, Maya Angelou, I found a poem of hers, The Health Food Diner. No sprouted wheat and soya shoots and Brussels in a cake, carrot straw and spinach raw. Today, I need a steak. Not thick brown rice and rice pilau or mushrooms creamed on toast, turnips mashed and parsnips hashed. I'm dreaming of a roast. Health food folks around the world are thinned by anxious zeal. They look for help in seafood kelp. I count on breaded veal. <laughs> no smoking signs, raw mustard green, zucchini by the ton. Uncooked kale and bodies frail are sure to make me run to loins of pork and chicken thighs and standing ribs so prime. Pork chops brown and fresh ground round. I crave them all the time. Irish stews and boiled corned beef and hot dogs by the scores or any place that saves a space for smoking carnivores. <laughs> I would not have guessed that she wrote that. I don't know when she wrote that at the Health Food Diner. Thank you, Maya Angelou. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, yeah, the indelible, indelibly edible certain places, yes, occupied at times in lives, maybe like this one. Uh, this is... Um, part of Deja Vu, a folio on Asotto Saint, um, by, by, that, yeah, by Asotto Saint called Lady and Me. Quarter past eight, every weekday morning, white fake leather bags strapped on fat laps, she settles the same corner at Rico's in Midtown, where uh, Puerto Ricanos uh, y Dominicanos thunder greetings with orders in a lightning of Spanish. Discuss El Diario's headlines, gobble the $1.99 special of huevos con cuchifritos, bet numbers with Pepe, the bookie waiter, who jokes around and laughs while some of us curse and wait for honey-glazed donuts, hot buttered, uh, toasted buttered bagels, and the best café con leche this side of the Atlantic. Hazel eyes look out past a multitude of robots, mannequins marching in the garment district, delicate seamstress fingers lift and already full cup into which she slowly stirs many packets of sugar. She licks the spoon dry. The steam always halos her freckled caramel face like I caught her today, back from my sick leave, thirty pounds skinnier, out of breath, and uneasy about returning to work. I sat down next to her with a large, frosty bandito. She gazed at the ghost of me, asked, Amigo, como esta? Lady and me. Thank you, Asotto Saint. Gracias. Well, how could we talk about uh, diners and not talk about Nighthawks? Edward Hopper's uh, famous, um, from 1942, portrays people sitting in a downtown di diner late at night, and not only his most famous, but one of the most recognizable paintings in American art. Within months of its completion, it was sold to the Art Institute of Chicago for $3,000 and has remained there ever since. The four anonymous and uncommunicative night owls that are depicted seem as separate and remote from the viewer as they are from one another. Hopper denied that he purposely infused this or any other of his paintings with symbols of human isolation and urban emptiness, but he acknowledged that in Nighthawks, quote, unconsciously probably, I was painting the loneliness of a large city. Well, thank you very much uh, for, that's from edwardhopper.net, site about him and his work. And there's more about that. But we, we're going to keep going. Um, this is a poem by Susan Eisenberg, Mornings. Before the train screamed him through the tunnels, through tunnels to his windowless office, the idiots he had to, quote, Sir, my father needed a space without us. So in a crack of light from the bathroom, he dressed, held his shoes by two fingers, and left us sleeping. That walk to the diner, the last stars fading out, the sky lightening from black to blue to white, was his time. He walked in all weather, let each season touch him all over, lifted his face to rain and sun. He liked to watch the old houses stir awake and nod to the woman in her slippers on 27th, smoking as she strolled her little mutt, to step back smooth as Fred Astaire from the paper boy's wild toss. Milk bottles sweated on doorsteps, sweet cream on top, and once he lifted a quart from its wire basket, drank it down beneath our neighbor's winking porch light, and left the empty on the stoop. Good one.
Thank you, Susan Eisenberg. Mornings from her collection, Quiet City. I have to look that that collection up. Dip more into that. Uh, David Baker has. I'm just going to read you part one, uh, the beginning, tr- the truth about small towns. It never stops raining. The water towers tarnished as cutlery left damp in the widower's hutch. If you walk slow but don't stop, you're not from nearby. All you can eat for a buck at the diner is cream gravy on sourdough, blood sausage, and coffee. Never lie, the preacher before this one dropped bombs in the war and walked with a limp at parade time. Until it burned, the old depot was a disco, a cafe, a card shop, a parts place for combines. Randy and Rhonda shows up each spring on the bridge. If you walk fast, you did it. Nothing's more lonesome than money. Who says shop? S-H-O-P-P-E. It never rains. Thank you, David Baker. You might want to read the rest. That's poetryfoundation.org. You can find the rest of it. Well, I was, um, as I was musing on the, the universe of, of diner um, material and what they contain, um, each one of them, how they contain a, a, a universe unto themselves, a microcosm of a kind, um, I came across Christian Wyman's poem, W-I-M-A-N, sitting down to breakfast alone. Brachist, she called it, gentling grease over blanching yolks with an expertise honed from three decades of dawns at the Longhorn Diner in Lorraine, where even the oldest in the old men's booth swore as if it were scripture truth they'd never had a breakfast better, wrapping a glass sharply to get her attention when it went sorrowing so far into some simple thing, the jangly door or a crusted pan, the wall clock's black, hitchy hands, that she would startle, blink, then grin as if discovering them all again. Who remembers now when one died, the space that he had occupied went unfilled for a day, then two, three, until she unceremoniously plunked plates down in the wrong places and stared their wrong faces back to banter she could hardly follow. Unmarried, childless, homely, quote, slow, she knew coffee cut with chamomile kept the grocer Paul's ulcer cool. Yarrow and gravy eased the islands of lesions in Larry Borwick's hands. And when some night-long nameless urgency sent him seeking human company, Brother Tom needed hash browns with cheese. She knew to nod at the litany of cities. The big rig long haulers bragged her past. To laugh when the hunters asked if she'd pray for them or for the quail. They went laughing, laughing off to kill. And then, envisioning one rising so fast it seemed the sun tugged at it to do exactly that, who remembers where they all sat? Crook-backed builders, drought-faced farmers, VFers muttering through their wars, night shift roughnecks so caked and black it seemed they made their way back every morning from the dead. Who remembers one word they said? The longhorn diners long torn down, the gin and feedlots gone, the town itself now nothing but a name at which some bored boy has taken aim, every letter light-pierced and partial. Sister, Aunt Sissy, Bera Threlkeel, I picture you one dime-bright dawn grown even brighter now for being gone, bustling amid the formica and chrome of that small house we both called home during the spring that was your last. All stories stop. One more you're lost in something I can merely see. Steam spiriting out of black coffee, the scorched pores of toast, a bowl of apple butter like edible soil, bald cloth, knife light, the lip of a glass, my plate's gleaming, teeming emptiness. Wonderful. Thank you, Christian Wyman. New new poem to me from her. Um, sitting down to breakfast alone from her collection, Every Riven Thing. Wonderful. Okay, well... Coming to our last musings and sharings now for this time. Um, You may have been wondering when I might mention some films and songs. And uh, this is from the uh, AfterMovieDiner.com. It's a podcast mainly. And they they had top 10 diners on film. I said, I don't think there's any better eating establishment than a diner. Even a bad one is better than no diner. The menu is practically some version of anything you want. The inventive shorthand the waiting staff used to describe your order is a language of its very own. The vibe, noise, and people watching, terrific, and you can sit there as long as you want. Well, 
So he mentions some, some, some diners and scenes, but I'm just going to pick out the movies. You may remember the scenes in the diners. Five Easy Pieces with Jack Nicholson. This was after he made Easy, Easy Rider. Uh, Taxi Driver, um, the Scorsese film. Diner, that's probably the most uh, well-known. Barry Levinson's brilliant coming-of-age story and uh, homage to the end of the 50s. All-star cast, Steve Gutenberg, Daniel Stern, Mickey Rourke, Kevin Bacon, Ellen Barkin, and Paul Reiser. Deal with love, sex, marriage, music, movies, and sandwiches from the booths of the Fells Point Diner in Baltimore during the last week of 1959. In the classic scene, they ask the question, Sinatra or Mathis, and bicker over a roast beef sandwich. There's Groundhog Day, the movie when Harry met Sally. Um, the Big Lebowski. How about that one? Uh, the Coen Brothers, uh, 1998 cult classic. I've seen that many times, loosely based on Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. I did not know that. Well, the diner scene in question has to be the moment they write here that Wal Walter, John Goodman, convinced no kidnap has really been committed, tells the dude, the dude, Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Bridges, that he can get him a tow by three this afternoon before having his rights violated by a well-meaning diner employee. That is a wild movie. Wild and wonderful. One of a kind. Um, from hip, his top 10.blogspot.com. Uh, top 10 cafe and diner songs. Uh, and he, it, he opens it by saying, Fancy coming down to the cafe? I, I think he's a Brit. Um, but he pulls out a line from his 10, he, the 10 uh, songs that he, 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 he thinks are terrific. Um, so I'm just going to give you the line. There's just one line per for peace. The, uh, the saint Antienne uh, uh, Mario's Cafe, saint, the song, saint Antienne Mario's Cafe, a cigarette, a cup of tea, a bun, lazy Tuesday morning spent in cafes, chewing the bacon rind with friends. Um, uh, at Smokey Joe's Cafe, the song, The Coasters, um, Libra and Stoller Corker, you better eat up all your beans, boy, and clear right on out. Um, let's see what else, what else is good. Uh, uh, Joni Mitchell, uh, Chinese Cafe. From She meets her old friend Carol at the Chinese Cafe, puts Unchained Melody on repeat play on the jukebox. What an amazing lyricist. This week's contractual I'm Getting Older Every Say song. This girl of my childhood games with kids nearly grown and gone, grown so fast like the turn of a page. We look like our mothers did now. When we, when we were those kids' age, nothing lasts for long. Yeah. And um, the last uh, mention here is one of the last is uh, the deli song, Dean Friedman, recorded live in a genuine New York deli or not, where Dean meets the woman of his dreams at four in the morning, but gets interrupted quite a lot by the noisy waitresses. Anyway, you may have your own songs about all these things. Okay. Um, Blue Plate by Jesse Lee Kirchevel, K-E-R-C-H-E-V-A-L. After the porno theater became a revival house, the neighborhood began to change. The Blue Plate, a designer diner, opened, all aluminum and curves. Inside, the menu featured revived comfort foods, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, a glass case full of pies. Young families moved in, the drawn shades of the elderly replaced by window boxes and big wheels in the yards. Another revival. Then a Mexican restaurant opened, though not, run, not one run by Mexicans. A pizza place whose specialty is a pie made with Greek, not Italian, cheese called the Fetalicious. <laughs> but what is real? In time, everyone came to depend upon the diner. Packed for breakfast, lunch, pie, and coffee. If you need a good plumber, go to the Blue Plate and ask for Carl, who's there talking politics with the other long-suffering followers of Trotsky. If you want a sitter, ask the waitstaff. Who has a younger sister? If you're invited to a potluck, stop and buy a whole pie. In the town where I grew up, there was a diner too, Bev's, named after the cook and owner who, my mother whispered the first time we went there, was a Holocaust survivor. When we went for breakfast or a hamburger, Bev would wait on us, her tattoo shining on her thick, damp wrist. She was not Jewish, but Czech and Catholic. She kept an infant of Prague by the cash register and changed his tiny satin outfits to match the seasons. But she didn't make pie, and her mashed potatoes came from the same box as my mother's. Bev's food wasn't good, only better than nothing. Just like being a death camp survivor, Bev told my mother it wasn't a good thing to be, only better than not being. My mother is dead now.
Bev, too. My mother wasn't a good cook either. Rarely made pies. I can, but I like the ones at the blue plate. Like them better. Dutch apple, three berry, lemon with mile-high meringue. The trouble with meringue, my mother said once, is that it weeps. Amazing, I thought. Sad pie. <laughs> Funny and bittersweet uh, and sweet. Blue Plate by um, Jessie Lee Kirschabal from her collection Dog Angel. Okay, well, next to last. Next to last, this is a piece uh, inspired by a story my hirsute friend in uh, New York City, Enrique, told me. Um, I, I took uh, the meeting uh, he and another uh, whiskered man had to an ever more fanciful place, I guess we could say. Meeting of the Beards and the Birds. When the two men met by chance at a cafe, likely why they met, they discovered birds were nesting in each other's beards, a yellow canary in one, a hidden finch in the other, and both of them began singing. Out to you, Enrique. To, if he's not listening, I'll tell him I shared that. And last for now, uh, till we're together again over these airwaves. This is a freshly made poem just for this show. I thought we should finish with a dessert. The poem is That Pie. Banana cream. The place, maybe a diner down in New Orleans or out in Santa Monica. I can't remember where. Only that generous, harmonious slice of bliss. The cloud of whipped cream Banana dreaminess in the eye, on the plate, on the fork, with the perfect sandy, buttery graham cracker crust. And decades since, the still-tasted joy of each pillowy, pale-sweet bite of that pie. Thank you again, friends, for leaning in here for thinking and feeling in, for visiting the lives and loves and stories and memories revolving around diners, luncheonettes, and soda fountains. I'd welcome hearing your experience of it. And uh, do freely share it out or share the whole playlist out. That's how others best find their way here. And if this broadcast greatly pleased you, I would welcome any contribution you might like to make in return. Among all these weekly offerings I create and freely offer to happily touch minds, hearts, spirits, and imaginations. And I hope I touched yours. You can uh, donate by Venmo to Fivefold, F-I-V-E-F-O-L-D, at Pipeline.com, or by PayPal to the same email. Or you can simply mail a check to me to P.O. Box 1032, Westerly, Rhode Island, 02891. Or also uh, contribute um, through the Donate tab at my site, thepoetorialist.com. Is there a theme you'd like to see a future show on? If so, let me know. Colin at thepoetosphere.com. Meanwhile, you can hear all the broadcast online, on YouTube, currently on the floating poetry playlist there, ultimately on other leading platforms. And these broadcasts, I should say, come to you through the Poetosphere, the oasis of possibility I'm guiding you can explore as a visitor or join as a subscriber. If you haven't already, take some time to get your senses wet there. You'll find all kinds of free and spirit-filling content and get a taste of our community of possibilitarians. And uh, <clears throat> to make joining more attractive, I've made month and year-long subscriptions available between now and early April of this year, 2024. Just 118 a year instead of 190 when using the code SPRING24, all caps, or 14 a month instead of 19 when using the code SPRING NOW, all caps, all one word. Thepoetosphere.com. And I w await you. I'd also like to point out to, uh, to a just released album um, out on Spotify and every streaming platform. It's called Oases, O A S E S. Oases of Regenesis, something to take you, to open you to, to places of greater aliveness in short order. Well, I hope you lean in here soon again. 
Until then, dear listeners, savor any good diner, luncheonette, or soda fountain still doing things the wonderfully old-fashioned way. If by good fortune you, you chance across one and enjoy the worthwhile stories or memories you may have of them, the best of them, or things you heard about in my show tonight that you took a liking to or found especially interesting or surprising. Goodbye for now, and good spirits over easy.